طيب بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا The Imam he says وَفُرُودُهُ سِتَّةٌ وَفُرُودُهُ سِتَّةٌ Before that he says باب فُرُودُ الْوُدُوء وَصِفَتِهِ The chapter pertaining to the obligations of wudu and the description of wudu So فرض لغة فرض in the language is تأثير على شيء is to have an effect upon something whether that effect is through cutting a thing or through shaking it or just moving the state of it so it literally means to have an effect on something technically istilahan al-fard in the fiqh is ma yuthab ala fi'lihi wa yu'aqib ala tarkihi that which is rewarded if it's done and punished if it's left right and fard and wajib is interchangeable to the majority of the ulama except for the ahnaf may Allah have mercy upon them except for the Hanafi scholars they have a separate definition and understanding of what is wajib as compared to fard but for the majority and us included studying the humbly text fard and wajib is interchangeable so it means as we said you're rewarded for doing it for the sake of Allah and you're uh, liable to be punished for leaving it the reason I say liable because Allah Zawajal may excuse you for whatever reason he wishes subhanahu wa ta'ala so the Imam he says فروده ست its obligations its wajibat are six okay the first of them he says غسل الوجه والفم والأنف منه to wash the face and the nose and the mouth are from them in Surah Al-Ma'idah Allah says يا أيها الذين آمنوا أو يهب وليف إذا قمتم إلى الصلاة فاغسلوا وجوهكم وأيديكم إلى المرافق when you stand up for the prayer, then wash your faces and your hands up until your elbows. وَمْسَحُونَ بِرُؤُوسِكُمْ And wipe your head. وَأَرْجُلَكُمْ إِلَى الْكَعْبَيْنِ And wash your feet up until and including the ankles, right? So this is known as the verse of wudu in Surah Al-Ma'idah. So from there we see that Allah Azza wa Jal, He mentioned washing the face. فَغْسِلُوا وَجُوهَكُمْ Okay, and we know that the nose and the mouth is from the face. Why? Because Okay, that is what you face people with. Your face meaning that is what you face people with, the nose and the mouth. So they have to be washed also as an obligation, included in the washing of the face. And also the Prophet ﷺ is never reported that he left these two limbs out. So he would always wash his nose and his mouth. Therefore it's given the ruling as being obligatory. And to wash the hands is also obligatory. Allah Azawajal said in that verse, وَأَيْدِيكُمْ إِلَى الْمِرَافِقِ And to wash your hands until and including the elbows. So the hands starting from the tips of the fingers all the way up to and including the elbows. Now this point here is a difference between a difference of opinion between the ulama. Are the elbows included or not? The Hanbali scholars, they say yes, because they say the word إِلَى وَأَيْدِيكُمْ إِلَى الْمِرَافِقِ and your hands, ila, the word ila, the preposition, to your elbows. Ibn Qudama rahimullah ta'ala in al-Mughni, he said, al-had idha kana min jins al-mahdud dakhala fihi. The had, meaning the end of a thing, if it's from the same um, noun of that which is being described or discussed, then it enters into it. So you see that the elbow is from the same noun, it's from the same limb as that which is being described, so it enters into it. Whereas if it's not from the same noun, then it won't enter into it. For example, وَأَتِمُّ الصِّيَامِ إِلَى الليل. And complete your siyam until, ila, the same preposition, until the night. So the siyam, there's a difference between the day and the night. So therefore the siyam is not included to be entered into the night. Whereas in our situation, it is included. So the elbows are included with the washing of the hands and the arm. And also in Sahih Muslim, Abu Hurair radiallahu anhu uh, washed his elbows and, ab and above and he said, I saw the Prophet sallallahu doing so. Meaning referring to the washing of the elbows. The Imam, he says thereafter, وَمَسْهُ الرَّعْسِ وَمِنْهُ الْأُذَنَانِ And to wipe the hair and from that wiping is the wiping of the ears. Allah said in the verse, وَمْسَحُمْ بِرُؤُوسِكُمْ And wipe 
your head. وامسحوا ب حرف الجر ب وامسحوا ب رؤوسكم. Now this also is a difference of opinion amongst the ulama. The Hanbali ulama they say this ب here, this ب comes with the meaning of إلصاق. إلصاق. إلصاق means استيعاب الرأس بالمسح. That you cover the whole of your head with a wiping. Okay. So the ب وامسحوا ب رؤوسكم. This ب according to the Hanbali scholars means الساق that it covers the whole of your استيعاب الرأس that the whole of your head must be covered. Other ulama they say no this ب comes with the meaning of تبعيد. Tabaid has the meaning of partial, okay? That the ba indicates just a partial action, that you only have to wipe a part of your head, right? But al ulama, the humble ulama, they said no, it has the meaning of, as I said, al saq and isti'ab al ra's kulluhum. Why? They said that in the Arabic language, the ones who claim this meaning of tabaid, they are coming with something. which is not found amongst the Arabic grammarians and the scholars of the Arabic language. That this has not been found before. This meaning of tab'id, that you only use part of your hair in wiping because of the ba meaning that or indicating that, then this is not found in the Arabic language according to our scholars. So our scholars says that, say that the ba means all of the wiping. And they also say, to strengthen their opinion, that those who say that you can wipe only part of your hair because the ba means tab'id, that the ba means only partial wiping, they have so many opinions as to what equates that partial wiping. Is it three hairs? Is it four hairs? And they say that وَجُودُ تَفَصِيلُ كَثِيرًا فِي قَوْلٍ بِلَا أَدِلَّ دَلِيلٍ عَلَى دَعْفِهِ ضَعْفِهِ That the fact that there's so many differences of opinions as to what it means, what suffices as wiping, due to that opinion which says that part of the hair only needs to be wiped. The fact that there's so many difference of opinions without evidence indicates that this opinion is weak. Because if it was a strong opinion, it wouldn't have this much variety of difference of opinions without being supported by evidence. طيب, how do you wipe your hair? How do you wipe your hair in wudu? Loudly, please. Where do I start from? Front of your hair to the back of your hair, right? Then what? Then? I can't hear you, sorry. Then back to the front. Good, this is one way of doing it. What's another way of doing it? Yes, Uthman. To just wipe it once? To just wipe it once is permissible also. The other way to do it is to wipe from the back to the front and then from the front to the back. So we've taken two ways of doing it, as well as what Uthman said, you can wipe it just once if you wish to do so. There's a third way. Third way of doing it is if you're blessed to have long hair and you don't want to mess your hair up because you have a panic attack if your hair is out of place, you can follow the partition of your hair. You can follow the way your hair flows, okay? So in the method that your hair flows, you just wipe that way and that suffices. طيب. And in reality, they say it's there that suffices that you won't be considered as having not wiped your hair if you do it in any which way that you decide to do so. The point is that your hair is wiped. But the sunnah, the, the ways that are reported by the Prophet Sallallahu is from front to back and then back to front, or back to front and then front to back, or following the direction of your hair if you have long hair and you do not wish to mess your hair up. Tayyib. And as for the ears, that we said from the wiping of the head is also to wipe the ears because we have the hadith of Abi Umama radiyallahu anhu as collected by Imam Ahmad who said that the Prophet sallallahu said al-udhanan min al-ra's that the two ears are considered to be part of the head therefore when you wipe the head you also have to as an obligation wipe your ears okay this particular hadith collected by Imam Ahmad is weak as mentioned by Sheikh Hamad al-Hamad in his explanation of this book Zad al-Mustaqna however the Sheikh Hamad He said that there's many other narrations that when put together, they strengthen each other. Okay, so the point is still valid. They strengthen each other. Imam Al-Khilal, uh, the companion of Imam Muhammad, he held the opinion that it's recommended, like the majority. He held the opinion that to wipe the ears is recommended and not obligatory. In any case, if you were to hold the opinion that it's only recommended for you to wipe your ears, you should still wipe your ears, خُرُوجًا مِنَ الْخِلَافِ to come out of the difference of opinion because there is an opinion which is saying that it's wajib which is the opinion of the madhab, the opinion of the Hanbali scholars so even if you hold that it's mustahab, just sunnah 
then you should still wipe your ears unless you're in a situation where you only have a tiny amount of water. The Imam, he says, وَغَسْلُ rijlain And to wash the feet. وَأَرْجُلَكُمْ إِلَى الْكَعْبَيْنِ Allah said in that verse. And to wash your feet up to and including the ankles, right? So it's not enough to wipe your feet. You have to wash your feet. When can you wipe your feet? What situation? When you're wearing socks and you want to make mas'h upon the khuf. Or where, when else could it be? Bandages, etc. If you're in an extreme situation of uh, being sick or ex extremely cold and you know that by washing your feet it may harm you. In these type of situations. Otherwise, normal washing is an obligation. What does the Imam say next as an obligation? Sequence. Ahsanti, you memorize the text. Barakallahu <laughs> feek. Wa tartib. And to have tartib. Tartib is to do things in order. Okay? To have sequence when you are doing your wudu. Why? What's the proof for this? That you have to have things in sequence. Go back to the ayah. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu idha qumtum ila salah. O you who believe, if you stand for the prayer, faghsilu wajuhakum. Then wash your face. Wa aidiyakum ila al-marafiq. And your hands up into your elbows. Wa msahu bi ru'usikum. And wipe your heads. Wa arjulakum ila ka'bain. Ila al-ka'bain. And wash your feet up until and including the ankles. So from this verse, the ulama, they extrapolate that there is an obligation also to have tartib, to do things in order. Anybody know why from that verse? Because when you look at the verse, you find that Allah Azawajal is using a type of speech which is contrary, contrary to that which is known to the Arabs. So the Arabs in general, they would, they would speak about one thing first or one group of affairs, then move on to another matter. Allah Azawajal in this verse, you find that he's speaking about washing, washing your face and then the washing of your hands up to your elbows. And then he jumps to what? To wiping. And then again, he goes back to washing. So the only reason Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did this to break away from the norm of the Arabic speech is to show you the importance of tartib, the importance of doing things in order. And also because it's never been reported from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa that he made wudu out of tartib. That he made wudu out of tartib. The Imam, he says, وَالْمُوَالَاتُ And to have muwalat, continuity. Okay, to have continuity in the wudu. And the Imam, he describes it as following. He says, Allah you akhira ghasla udwin hatta yanshafa alladhi qablahu. That you, don't, you do not delay washing the next limb to the extent that the limb before, the one that you've just washed, becomes dry. Okay? And explainers in Rawdul Murbi and other places, they add, fi zaman al mu'tad. Fi zaman al mu'tad means in normal weather conditions right because if it's extremely hot then of course your your limbs will dry very quickly so here the imam is saying that you must have muwalat muwalat as we said is that it's continuity in the act of wudu to the extent that you shouldn't allow the the limb that you've just washed to dry before you move on to the next limb in a normal situation right so if we find for example that it takes two minutes for a limb to dry then for you to delay going to the next limb in wudu more than two minutes means that your wudu is not valid, right? Why? Because in the hadith, the Prophet وسلم, is narrated by Ahmad and Abu Dawood. رَأَى رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم رَجُلًا يُصَلِّي وَفِي ظَهْرِ قَدْمِهِ لُمْعَةٌ قَدْرُ الدِّرْحَمْ لَمْ يُصِبْهَ الْمَاءِ That the Prophet وسلم, his eyes fell upon a man that was praying. And he noticed that on the back of his foot was lum'a, a space the size of a coin, a dirham, wherein water had not reached or it had dried, right? While the rest of his foot was still wet. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Yu'id al Wudu was Salah. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi ordered him to repeat his wudu and to repeat the salah. Right? So what's the proof from the hadith to show you that muwalat is an obligation? What's the wajhud dalal from the hadith? Excellent, Ahsant. He had to repeat the whole wudu. If it was not an obligation, the Prophet ﷺ would have said to him, just wash that part. By, by, by virtue that the Prophet ﷺ made him repeat the whole wudu in the salah, it shows you that the wudu was not integral, the wudu was not correct, because the muwalat was not there. Tayyib? Anything to add, Muhammad? 
The reason I said that because we had a discussion once on Mu'alat and there's, mashallah tabarakallah, there's a discussion on the reality of what Mu'alat is. Because some of the ulama, they say, it goes back to what is known as Urf. Urf is customary, customary norms, right? Because they say, كُلَّمَا لَمْ يَثْبُتْ فِي الشَّرْءِ وَلَا فِي اللُّغَةِ تَحْدِيدًا يَرْجِعَ إِلَى الْيُقَيِّدُ بِالْأُرْف That everything which is not defined by the text or by the Arabic language, that its definition goes back to the urf, to the customary norms of the people. So this muwalat, what does it actually mean? It's not defined in the Sharia or in the Arabic language. Many ulama, they say, it goes back to the customary norms of the people. So if the customary norm of a society is that, you know, you can wait for three to four minutes, that's normal for you, before you move on to do your next uh, limb in the wudu, then that is what is acceptable. But the ulama of the madhab is as we explained, right? They said that it's the, the definition is that the body part should not dry before you move on to the next part. Excuse me. The Imam he says, That niyyah is a condition, niyyah is intention. Niyyah is a condition for all types of purification pertaining to ahdath. Ahdath from the word hadith. What is hadith? Hadith is not impurity. Huh? I heard it. Somebody said it. Ritualistic impurity, right? It's rit- ritualistic impurity. An intangible description which is found in the body which prevents somebody from praying and like the actions of praying. Okay, so we have that which is hadith al-asghar, the things which require you to make wudu. And then we have hadith al-akbar, the things which require you to make ghusl. So the Imam is saying both of these categories of hadith, hadith, they need niyyah for it to be lifted. You have to have an intention, otherwise your hadith will not be lifted. So niyyah linguistically, in the language, it has the meaning of qast, qast. Qast means to seek something out, to intend something, okay? Technically, istilah and the meaning of niya is azmul qalb ala fi'l al-ibadah is the determination of the heart to do an act of worship. That is the technical definition. Azmul qalb ala fi'l al-ibadah that the heart is determined upon doing an act of worship. That is the technical definition. In Bukhari and Muslim, it's narrated the famous hadith, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ وَإِنَّمَا لِكُلِّ إِمْرٍ مَا نَوَى That verily all actions, actions of worship, are tied to the intentions, meaning that they must have an intention. And for every person, they are rewarded according to their intention. If their intention was to please Allah Azawajal, then they are rewarded for that. And also the intention differentiates what type of worship you are doing. You're praying for raka, but what are you praying those four raka for? Are they four raka of sunnah or are they four raka of fard, for example? Okay, so this is the purpose of the niyyah. First and foremost, who are you doing it for? You're doing it sincerely for Allah. May Allah make us from those who do that. I mean, and also to differentiate the acts of worship. And what is the place of the niyyah? The ulama they say its place is the heart. Okay, the place of the niyyah is the heart. So the imam he said that the niyyah is sharq, it's a condition. So what does this condition mean? What, what is the definition of condition? The ulama, they say condition in fiqh, مَا يَلْزِمُ مِنْ عَدَمِهِ الْعَدَمِ وَلَا يَلْزِمُ مِنْ وُجُودِهِ الْوُجُودِ وَلَا عَدَمْ لِذَاتِهِ Again, مَا يَلْزِمُ مِنْ عَدَمِهِ الْعَدَمِ وَلَا يَلْزِمُ مِنْ وُجُودِهِ الْوُجُودِ وَلَا عَدَمْ لِذَاتِهِ That this shart, this condition, its definition is that which that which necessitates from its absence, the absence of the act of worship. Okay, either that it's not valid or it's not taking place. That which necessitates from the absence of the condition, the absence of the act of worship. But it doesn't necessitate that if, yes, that if it, it doesn't necessitate that if you do, if you do the act, if you have the intention that you will in fact do the act of worship or you will not do the act of worship. So let's give an example for this. So wudu is a condition, is a shart for salah, right? If I don't have this condition, can I have the salah? There's no way it's impossible, right? So it necessitates from its absence, the absence of the act of worship. 
But if I do have wudu, it doesn't necessitate that I would go ahead and pray or I will not pray. So this is the definition, as the ulama explained, of what is a shart, right? So the imam is saying that the niyyah is a condition for your tahara, that you have to have niyyah for your tahara, for your wudu or your ghusl to be valid, okay? And one thing to add here, that niyyah is not a condition for the other type of tahara, which is izalatul najasa, which is the removing of the physical impurities. Why? Because maybe I've got impurity on my clothing. And after washing in the rain, after walking in the rain for 10 minutes, the rain washes that impurity away. I didn't intend to wash it away, but the rain washed it away. Now the ruling is that the thob or the clothing is pure, which shows that we don't have to have an intention when it comes to removing of impurities. The intention is there for the first part of the tahara, which is raf al-hadith, the removing the state of hadith, right? The dhabit, dhabit means the determining factor or the determining rule, the determinator, for which actions require you to have a niyyah. What is the dhabit for which actions require you to have a niyyah? Sheikh Salam Ibn Taymiyyah, he said, كل عمل لم يعرف إلا من الشارع فإنه لا يصح إلا بالنيه. He said, every action which was not known except through the Sharia, then this action is not going to be correct except with the niyyah. So for example, wudu. Okay, wudu was never known except through the Sharia. People used to wash before, but not in the way that we were prescribed to, to wash. Okay, so that is, is an example or definition pertaining to which actions require the niyyah. So niyyah, this condition of the intention in the acts of worship, pertaining to tahara, it has arba'a suwar, fahad. It has four scenarios, four scenarios, okay? The first of them the imam mentions, fayanwi raf al-hadith, that the person with his niyyah, he intends raf al-hadith, and this is the correct situation, that a person with his niyyah, he intends to remove the state of hadith, and then by doing so, his hadith will be removed when he makes the wudu or he makes the ghusl. Tayyib? Another scenario, the second one that Imam he mentions, he says, Oh, or the person intends to make tahara for an action which cannot be done except with tahara. Give me an example of that. An action which cannot be done except with tahara. Ahsant, touching the mushaf and reading from the mushaf. So according to the Jamhur ulama, you need to have wudu when you do so, right? So here the Imam is saying that the person intends to do the action because that action cannot be done except by having tahara. So in his definition here, the Imam is saying the person didn't intend to make raf al-hadith. That, wouldn't, that didn't come to his mind. He's in a state of hadith, but it didn't come to his mind that I'm going to remove the hadith. Remove the state of hadith. What came to his mind is that I want to read Quran. I'm going to make the intention to make wudu for reading the Quran. So the Imam is saying that this also includes raf al hadith. Because raf al hadith is mutadamman, is included in this action. Because this action cannot take place without raf al hadith. Okay? So that's why the Imam is saying that even in this situation, then uh, his uh, tahara is valid. And also a secondary understanding of this sentence that the Imam is saying. He's saying that if the person made wudu, for example, with the intention, like the brother said, to read Quran. But then the person went ahead and prayed. Did he make intention to make wudu for praying? He didn't. But by virtue of the fact that he made intention for an act which requires hadith to be lifted, therefore he can go ahead and do all the other acts which would require for hadith to be lifted. This is also understood from this sentence. A third situation that Imam he mentions, he says, فَإِنَّوَا مَا تُسَنُّ لَهُ طَهَارَ كَكِرَاءَةٍ This part here is attached, this part of the sentence is attached to the part of the sentence which comes after it. So we'll read it together. فَإِنَّوَا مَا تُسَنُّ لَهُ طَهَارَ كَكِرَاءَةٍ So if he intends what is recommended for him to make tahara for, like reading the Qur'an, he means he reading the Qur'an without touching it, making dhikr of Allah or going to bed, something like this, right? أو تجديدا مسنونا أو to make a sunnah wudu whilst forgetting that he is in a state of hadith then his hadith will be lifted so let's go back to the first part 
tahara. So if the person intends to make tahara for that which it is recommended to do so, like reading. Like reading here, he means like um, reading the Quran without touching it, right? Or another example the ulama give is like you make the uh, wudu with the intention of making wudu for going to bed. And you were in a state of hadith. So your niyyah wasn't to remove the hadith. Your niyyah was a sunnah wudu because you didn't remember that you had hadith, hadith. So you made wudu to go to bed, for example. But then before going to bed, you had an increase in iman, alhamdulillah. And you said, okay, let me pray a few raqa'ah. May Allah make us from them who do that. And then you're going to go ahead and pray a few raqa'ah. What is the situation of this person? The imam is saying that his tahara is valid. His tahara is valid in this situation. Number one, he forgot that he was a state of hadith. And number two, he made a tahara which from the Sharia perspective, outwardly, is the normal tahara, okay? In essence. So if you're in a situation, to make it simple, that you forgot your hadith, the Imam is saying, you forgot you were in a state of hadith, and you made tahara for that which is sunnah for you to do so, like going to bed or reading the Quran, then your hadith is lifted. And the fourth sentence, the Imam, he says, oh, tajdeed and masnoonan, or you want to make a tajdeed masnoon. And we mentioned before, what is tajdeed al wudu? What is the renewing of wudu? What, 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 what's the second part you said? I didn't hear you. Good. Making fresh wudu even though you still have a valid wudu. That's not enough. Ahsant. You have used that wudu already to do an act of worship like praying. Okay? That's tajdeed. That's al-masnoon. The sunnah tajdeed is that you have wudu, right? But then you go ahead like the Prophet ﷺ would do. It's narrated about him in Bukhari. That can Nabi ﷺ yatawadda'u in the kulli salah. That the Prophet ﷺ, he would make wudu for every salah. Meaning that his wudu, he would have used it for the previous salah. So he's still in the state of wudu. But the next salah comes along and he refreshes his wudu. So this is tajdeed wudu, okay? So in this situation, if a person with his intention is that he wants to make tajdeed wudu, but he's forgotten that he broke his wudu, right? Then his wudu is still lifted for him. Then his wudu, his hadith is still lifted for him in this situation. The Imam, he says, وَإِن نَوَى غُسْلًا مَسْنُونًا And if a person is making ghusl, masnoon, a sunnah ghusl. A sunnah ghusl, according to one opinion, like the ghusl of Jum'ah, okay? Like making ghusl for Jum'ah. So if the person intends that he's going to make ghusl or Jum'ah, أَجْزَاءَ and وَاجِبٍ وَكَذَا عَكْسُهُ Then this will suffice him for the wajib ghusl. So wajib ghusl is like a man has relationships with his wife and he ejaculates. Now in this situation, it's obligatory upon him to make wudu, to make ghusl. So this person in this situation, he forgot about his obligatory ghusl. But he made the intention to have a sunnah ghusl for the, for the Jummah, for example, right? So this sunnah ghusl suffices him and will remove the state of hadith al-akbar for him. Okay, because he forgot. They say the ta'leel, the ta'leel, the reasoning is that he comes with a shar'i tahara. He's come with tahara which is legislated by the sharia. Min jinsi, min jinsihi. From its type, from its type of uh, tahara. Therefore, that suffices him. So to make it simple again, the imam is saying that if a person makes sunnah ghusl whilst forgetting that he needs to make wajib ghusl then the sunnah ghusl suffices him from the wajib ghusl. وَكَذَلِكَ aksuhu, And likewise the opposite scenario. Like a person makes wudu ghusl on Jummah for having had relationships, right? This is an obligatory ghusl, right? So he makes this ghusl, but he forgets to make ghusl for Jummah. Then this obligatory ghusl suffices him for the sunnah ghusl also. However, he will not be rewarded for the sunnah ghusl unless he intended to do so, okay? This is what the uh, ulama mean in explaining this part of the sentence, of the statement of the imam. The author, he says, rahimullah ta'ala, when istama'at ahdathun tujibu wudu'an aw ghuslan. If in a person there are many ahdath which require him to make wudu' or ghusl. So for example, if a person passes wind, he has to make ghusl. If he urinates, he has to make ghusl. If he, uh, afwan, wudu. If he 
Yes, we're talking about wudu. Jazakallah khair. If he touches his private part, he has to make wudu, okay? If he eats camel meat, he has to make wudu. So this person did all of these things, all of these nawaqid of wudu, all of these things which put him in a state of hadd al asghar So the author is saying that even though this person has all of these different uh, ahdaf in him, right? He's broken his wudu due to a variety of reasons. It suffices him just to have the one intention. And the one intention is that he wants to make wudu. So for whatever reason he makes wudu for, then that suffices. All of the ahdath, or the reasons for the ahdath are removed. Because the point is, is not what causes your hadith. The point is that you remove or you, you put yourself in a situation now where you can do the act of worship by making wudu. Okay? So it's not about how many ahdath you have. It's about the fact that you remove one which will allow you to go ahead and worship Allah and this pertains also to ghusl so the person he intended with his purification one of these causes for the wudu or the ghusl and due to that intending then all of the situations are removed and the person must have this niya at the first wajib of the purification, which is the basmala. Why is that? The Imam is saying that the person must have the intention at the first wajib of the purification, which is the basmala. Why is that? Go back to our definition of niya. It's a shart, right? Which means that if it's not there, that the action or the part of the action that he does without the intention is not going to be valid. So it's imperative that when the person in the act of worship reaches the first obligatory part of the act of worship, he must therefore have the intention therein. Okay? At that point, it's a must. And it's sunnah for him to have it, the Imam says. And it's sunnah for him to have it at the sunnah or at the first sunnah if there is a sunnah found before the wajib and in wudu for example the first sunnah is to wash your hand three times right so say for example somebody washes his hand three times before saying the basmala then it's sunnah for him to to have the intention at the washing of the hands okay so the person he didn't say bismillah he said that afterwards right so first he washed his hand three times then he said Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim or Bismillah and then it's sunnah for him to have the intention whilst he's washing his hands right it's obligatory for him to have the intention when saying the Basmallah this is what the Imam is saying and he says وَإِسْتِسْحَابُ ذِكْرِهَا فِي جَمِئِهَا وَإِسْتِسْحَابُ ذِكْرِهَا means that he must pull it with him he must have the intention with him throughout the act of worship Afwan, not must istishab recommended for him okay it's mustahab for him to have the intention throughout the act of worship what does this mean it doesn't mean okay what it means is that it's recommended for him to remember what he is doing throughout the act of worship to remember that he's in a state of wudu throughout the act of worship okay this is what is recommended for him to have وَيَجِبُ and it's obligatory for him hukmiha, and it's obligatory for him to continue its ruling throughout the act of worship so we have, here we have two different things that Imam is saying first he's saying it's, it's recommended to you to continue remembering your intention to remember that you're doing the act of worship throughout that's highly recommended for you but what's obligatory for you is to keep the intention as a form of a ruling what that means is say for example I start making wudu. I'm washing my hands, but then I change my mind. I said, okay, I'm going to leave the wudu. I'm going to go and cook my food first, and then I'll come back. But just as I'm about to step out of the bathroom, I say to myself, no, I'll come back. I'll finish the wudu. So then you go ahead and you finish the wudu. Here, your wudu is invalid because you didn't keep the hukm. You didn't keep the ruling of the intention throughout the act of worship. You broke it in the act of worship. Therefore, your wudu is not valid. However, if you were making wudu, and you're getting married in a few hours time and you're so excited and you're thinking about how beautiful your wife to be is going to be and you're not concentrating on the act of worship hey what's the ruling of your wudu your wudu is valid hukman your wudu is valid in terms of its ruling 
Okay? However, you miss out on all the reward for not having concentrated. Yeah? So basically, the Imam is saying that it's recommended for you to think of what you are doing throughout the act of worship, your intention, but you cannot break your niyyah throughout the act of worship, right? You cannot have taraddud. You cannot break your niyyah throughout the act of worship. Other shurut of wudu, which are not mentioned here, but other ulama mention it, such as Sheikh Hamad al Hamad in his explanation. In total, there are eight. The first of them is what? What did we just mention? Niyyah, right? The rest of them, write these down, Islam, that you must be a Muslim. Aql, that you must have your faculties of intelligence about you. Tamiz, that you must reach the age of puberty. Okay? And the fourth of them, izalatu ma yamna'u wasul al-ma ila al-bashar. That you remove that which prevents the water from touching your skin. So for example, if you have some paint or something henna of that sort on your skin, you have to remove that unless it's water-based henna that, that the water can go through. So the water must touch the skin. So if there's something there which is preventing the water from touching the skin, then you have to remove that, right? The fifth of them is tuhuriyatul ma, that the water must be pure. The water must be pure. The sixth of them is ibahatul ma, that the water must be permissible. It's not water which is from a waq, waqf. What's waqf? Endowment. If it's water which is from an endowment, for example, which is specific only for drinking, then it's not permissible for you to, to use that water. Or if it's stolen water. So tuhuriyatul ma, the water must be pure. Wa ibahatuhu that the water must be permissible for you to use. And the last of them, and the last of them, وَإِبَاهَتُهُ is that دَخُولُ الْوَقْتُ الصَّلَاةِ لِمَنْ كَانْ حَدُثُهُ دَائِمًا that the time for the prayer has come in for the one who has continuous hadith. Continuous hadith is like the one who has salas al-bawl, عَزَّكُمُ اللَّهُ is like the one who has continual urine drops. Right? So his hadith never really leaves him. So how does he make wudu? He can only make wudu, tahara, at the beginning time of prayer. Okay? So these are the conditions for wudu. Eight of them, inshallah. What does the Imam say? How long have we been going for, brothers? Anyone know? Tayyip. Wasifatul wudu. The description of the wudu, the Imam he says, and yanwi, that you must make intention. What's the intention? What's the hukum of the intention? What's the ruling of the intention? I can't hear you guys, man. Shout. What's the ruling of the intention? Is it mubah? Is it uh, wajib? Is it haram? Is it shart? What is it? It's shart. Good. And yanwi, thumma yusammi. Then he must say bismillah. What's the basmillah? What's the ruling? Huh? Wajib. Somebody said that, I'm sure. ثُمَّ يَغْسِلُ كَفَيْهِ ثَلَاثًا Then he washes his hand three times, right? At the beginning of the wudu, what's this? Sunnah, very good. ثُمَّ يَتَّمَدْ مَضَى وَيَسْتَنْشِقْ And then he must uh, gargle the water in his mouth and take the water into his nose. Istinshaq. What's the ruling of this? Wajib, right? وَيَغْسِلُ وَجْهَهُ And then he must wash his face. What's the ruling of washing your face? Wajib. من منابت الشعر رأس إلا من حدر من اللحيين والذقن طولا. The Imam he says that you wash your face from the hairline of a normal person. Because some people have a hairline in the middle of the forehead. Can't see anyone with that. Or hairline in the middle of their head, right? So from the normal person, from the hairline down to and including the jaws and including the chin. The, the chin. This is <laughs> this is what must be washed. Okay, from your hairline including your jaws and your chin. Okay, all of this must be included. Uh, and from your ear to your ear in width of your face. So again, from hairline, including your jaws down to your chin, including your ear to your ear. Also including the white part. Include the white part, which is just in front of your ear. That has to be washed also. And the Imam he mentions وَمَا فِيهِ مِنَ الشَّعْرِ خَفِيف And any hair that is on your face, if it's khafif, khafif means that it's light and you can see beyond it the skin. 
If you can see beyond it, the skin, this must be washed to the extent that water reaches the skin. وَظَاهِرُ kathif. But if it's heavy, like thick eyebrows, then it suffices just to wash the outer part of it. مَا مَسْتَرْسَلَ مِنْهُ Also included in that is the beard, right? You're supposed to have a beard. Wajib upon you to have a beard, obligatory. So if you have a thick beard, then it suffices for you to wash the outer part of your beard. And it's sunnah to make takhlil, to go beyond that. What about if your beard is long? You're one of those who is blessed with a very long beard like Ali radiallahu anhu used to have. What do you do with the length of your beard? You also have to wash that. That's also an obligation. Because that's from ma yuwajihu bihi. That's from the waj, that which is faced. Okay? You face people with it. So it's considered to be part of your face. So also that which comes down from your beard has to be washed. Okay? Two. And then you wash your hands up until your elbows and we said this is wajib from where? From your fingertips up until including your elbows. And then you wipe all of your head one time. We said one time but we're wiping twice. What's going on here? Look, you're wiping from your front and then you're wiping back to your front. That's twice. So what, how do we consider it once? How? That's two wipes. You, you've wiped and you've wiped again. That's two. It's two actions. But how is it considered one? Because they say that you're wiping the outer hair and then when you come back, you're wiping the inner hair. Okay, this is what they say. That's why it's one wipe. Allah knows best. What about long hair? The hair which is long. Okay, if you're blessed to have long hair with your brother or sister, then what about the long hair? The long hair, as Sheikh Hamad mentions, that you don't need to wipe. So this is different to the face. The face, the beard, which is long, you have to wipe because this is ma yuwajihu bihi. This is what you face people with. But the hair, the hair is from ras taras or tafa. Okay, that which is is on your head, right? That is which, which is considered needed to wipe. But that which falls down from your head, that you do not need to wipe. Okay. With regards to wiping the head, what if somebody gets excited and they wash their hair instead of wiping their hair? Like kids do this a lot, right? What did someone say? It's fine, simple as that. He's right, but there's something we have to add. It's fine when or if. Ahsent, if you wipe with the washing, as long as your hand goes over your head, your head, then it's considered okay. What if you wipe your head with a wet cloth? Also the ulama, they said it's fine. Tayyip, in this situation. The ears are wiped. How do you wipe your ears? Because the ears are part of the head. So you put your thumb on the outside, your sababa on the inside, and you wipe, okay? Up and down. طيب. And then you wash your feet, including the ankles. And we said that there's a sunnah that you do with your feet, which is that you make takhlil, that you rub between your toes. And the one who is an amputee, if he has anything left from the limb, which is obligatory to wash, then he washes that part of the limb. فَإِنْ قُطِيَ مِنَ الْمَفْصِلِ But if it's, if it's cut, if it's cut from the, from the joint, if it's cut from the joint, okay, غَسَلَ رَأْسُ الْعَدُدِي مِنْهُ Then he washes the next part of the limb. So for example, لَا سَمْحَ اللَّهِ If somebody has, the, the arm is cut from the elbow, and all he has is the limb from above the elbow, then he just washes that part of the limb. Because Allah says, فَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ مَا اسْتَطَعْتُمْ Fear Allah as much as you can. Do as much as you can, right? So generally, when you wash, you go above the elbow to ensure that you have washed the elbow. So that's why they say, if you're unfortunate to be in that situation where the limb is cut from the joint, then you just wash a little bit above that. طيب. What if one has a prosthetic limb? If you have a prosthetic limb, do you have to wash that limb? You wipe it. Why do you wipe it? Can't hear you. If it's not part of the body, then why do you have to wipe it? And that, that's exactly the answer. The answer is because Allah, وجل, what did He say? وَأَيْدِيكُمْ إِلَى الْمَرَافِكِ And your hands, meaning your limbs, so the prosthetic limb is not part of you, right? It's prosthetic, it's fake. So therefore you don't have to include it in the wudu. 
Okay, even if you use it, even if it's to the modern standard where you can actually use it and do functions with it. However, if the limb has on it some najasa, can you still say, okay, if I don't have to wipe it for the wudu, it means I don't have to clean it. Why not? But it's not part of your body. We established that it's not part of your body. Ascent, because it's now you are carrying the najasa. Okay, like if it was on your clothes, you would be carrying the najasa. So in this situation, you would have to remove the uh, impurity from the limb. Then he raises his eyes to the heavens and he says the dua, which is um, related. This part about raising your eyes to the heavens, uh, some of the ulama, like, like Sheikh Ahmed al Khalid, they said it's not authentic. Okay? But they say we don't call it a bid'ah, we don't call it an innovation. Why? Because there are those ulama that hold it to be authentic. To them, the hadith is authentic. So he says in situations like this, where there is some room for justification, then we cannot call it a bid'ah. Rather, we just say it's not legislated. Okay? Because we have to have respect with those ulama who, through their research, valid research, came to the conclusion that it is authentic. Even though we, the ulama, he's talking about himself, through our research, say that it's not authentic, right? So in situations like this where it's valid, difference of opinion, we cannot call it a bid'ah yet, we say it's not legislated. I mentioned by Sheikh Ahmed Khalil in his explanation, page 103. From the du'as to be said, is that which is narrated in Sahih Muslim, Umar radiallahu anhu, he said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, wudu. There is nobody from amongst you who makes wudu and he makes isbaq of the wudu. Isbaq of the wudu, like we said previously, is that you give every limb its right in washing and in wiping. That there is none of you who says, who makes wudu and perfects his wudu and then says this dua, La ilaha illallah, wahdahu la sharika la. أَشْهَدُ أَنْ لَا إِلَهِ لَلَّهُ وَأَشْهَدُ أَنَّ مُحَمَّدًا عَبْدُهُ وَرَسُولُهُ إِلَّا فُتِحَتْ لَهُ أَبْوَابُ الْجَنَّةِ Right? I was mixing between two different hadiths there. That there's none of you who say this after making wudu, except that the eight gates of Jannah will be open for you and you will enter from any of them that you wish. SubhanAllah. So much reward in understanding how to make wudu and making it whilst remembering that you're doing it as an act of worship and was trying to do it to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so this is how the true believer is. Before he even gets into the salah, he starts to have khushu from the point of making wudu. From the point of making wudu is where your khushu starts for the salah. Imam Tirmidhi has an, has an uh, extra part which Shaykh Hamad al hamad said is authentic. Allahumma jalli min al-tawabina wa min al Oh Allah, make me from those who are oft repentant and from those who purify themselves often. This is also authentic. And it's permitted for the person to have help. What does it mean to have help in making the wudu? A person can pour the water for you, right? A person can bring the water for you if you need to. Can a person make wudu for you? It's disliked unless you're in a situation where you absolutely cannot make it yourself. Okay, so it's dislike, you should try to make it yourself. But if you cannot, then the person can make the wudu for you. Do your washing, do your wiping, etc. Except that he cannot do the sniffing for you, right? You have to ensure that you sniff it yourself. And to dry the body parts. Okay, that is also allowed in the wudu and it's part of the wudu. If you wish it to be so. The Imam, he mentioned this because many of the companions, it's narrated that Uthman radiallahu anhu, and Anas radiallahu anhu, they would do so. Okay, as mentioned by uh, Ibn Abi Shayba in his Musannaf. Ibn Abi Shayba mentioned this in his Musannaf. And also this is like the asl. The asl is that things are permitted unless a proof comes to show that it's not. However, there is a hadith of Maymuna radiallahu anha, the wife of the Prophet sallallahu where she said the Prophet sallallahu made wudu and then I gave him a rag to wipe himself with. But he didn't wipe himself with the rag, he rejected it. So some ulama, based upon this narration, they say it's not permitted for you to dry yourself. But Sheikh Mansour and others in his Ta'aliq al muqna of this Matan Zad al-Mustaqna, he said, look, the fact that Umm al-Mu'mineen Maymuna radiallahu anha brought the Prophet sallallahu the rag shows you that this was the norm. This is what she would customarily do. But it was just that in that instance that the Prophet sallallahu didn't want to use it. So it shows us that we can use wudu. Tayyib. And one last thing I would like to mention before we finish is that what is the amount of water that we should use when making wudu? We will say as little as possible, right? What is the amount of water that the Prophet would make wudu with? One mud. 
And one mud is two handfuls of water, cupped handfuls of water. Can you imagine? Just like this. The Prophet ﷺ, the most clean and the most who wants to perfect his acts of worship, would make it just like that. And us, we have the taps open, flowing continuously. This is Israf. And the Prophet ﷺ forbade this, even though the hadith is weak. He said, even if you were on the banks of a river, you shouldn't do so, but the meaning is correct, right? When it comes to Tajdeed al-Wudu, Shaykh Hamad al-Hamad in his explanation makes it, he mentions a very interesting mas'ala, an interesting issue. He said for Tajdeed al-Wudu, we have the Imams, Imam Ibn Khuzayma, Imam Ahmad, Imam Nisa'i, they collect a hadith where Ali radiallahu anhu stood up with some water. He made madmada uh, wa shaq, right? And then he wiped his face, his head and his hands to, to his arms and then drank from the water and he said this is the wudu of the one who is in a state of wudu and I saw the Prophet ﷺ do so so Shaykh Hamad said that in Tajdeed al-Wudu you don't have to wash it suffices you to wipe okay apart from washing your mouth and your nose everything else in Tajdeed al-Wudu it suffices you to wipe wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam jazakumullah khair for your patience and your attention I ask Allah Azawajal to make this deed heavy in our scale of good deeds ameen and to give us understanding of this deen and to make it from those who implement what we learn. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Anything which was correct was from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mistakes from my sh myself and shaitan. If you have any questions, then feel free.